Between the late evening of February 24, 1942, and the early morning hours of February 25th, the City of Angels went into a state of panic as what were initially believed to be German or Japanese enemy aircraft were spotted over the city. Taking place on the heels of the Pearl Harbor bombing, and just one day after a confirmed submarine attack off the Santa Barbara coast, the UFO sighting touched off a massive barrage of anti-aircraft fire with some 1,400 shells shot into the skies above Los Angeles and lasting the better part of the evening. Many people believe the aircraft were extraterrestrial with one eyewitness even describing an object he's seen as looking like an enormous flying lozenge, and some accusing the government of a cover-up, especially after conflicting accounts of the incident from the Navy and War Departments. As if to confirm public fears of extraterrestrial attack, one famous LA Times photograph emerged from the incident showing an ominous, saucer-like object hovering over the city. This much-debated photograph inspired America's first major UFO controversy a full five years before Roswell. And now for news of our own West Coast, we take you to Los Angeles and the report of Byron Palmer. Anti-aircraft guns went into action against unidentified aircraft in the Los Angeles area shortly after 3 a.m. Pacific War Time this morning. The anti-aircraft guns began barking during a blackout ordered by the 4th Interceptor Command at 2.25 a.m. The unidentified object, which some sources thought might be a blimp, moved slowly down the Pacific coast from Santa Monica and disappeared south of Long Beach. Army officials declined to comment on the possibility that the object might have been a blimp. However, it required nearly 30 minutes to travel some 25 miles far slower than an airplane. Watchers on the rooftop of the Columbia Broadcasting Building in the heart of Hollywood could plainly see the flashes of guns and searchlights sweeping the skies in a wide arc along the coastal area. Concussion of the shells could be felt in downtown Los Angeles, 15 miles away. U.S. Army planes quickly took to the dark skies, but whether they contacted the object has not been announced. Army officials say they will not comment until they receive a full report of the action. Although some watchers say they saw airplanes in the air, semi-official sources say they probably were the U.S. Army's pursuit. Several observers say they saw one or more planes spotlighted by 20 or 30 searchlights. The object moved southward, presumably over Huntington Park at the western edge of Los Angeles, and on southward to about Long Beach on the coast. By 3.30 a.m., observers said the object appeared to be over the south of Long Beach. Searchlights closely followed the object down the coast and kept it centered in their glare. Shells frequently could be seen bursting near the object, but none appeared to hit it. The shooting stopped about 3.30 a.m. The shooting brought warfare to the front door of this city of a million and a quarter population for the first time since December 7th. Already, it was alert to the presence off the Southern California coast of a Japanese submarine which had pumped 25 shells into an oil field north of Santa Barbara Monday evening. Because of the presence of the submarine, a three-hour alert was ordered at dusk last night, and civilian authorities stood at their posts while the Army and Navy continued their search for the submersible. The evening alert ended at 10.23 p.m., but another was sounded at 2.22 a.m., and the blackout followed within three minutes. It covered Los Angeles County from Santa Monica to Pomona. At 2.27, all Southern California radio stations were ordered off the air, except those in San Diego. Approximately 20 minutes after the firing died down, the ship returned and headed westward from Long Beach toward Santa Monica. The guns went into action again, hurling round after round of shells at the object. The second barrage appeared to be closer to downtown Los Angeles since watchers could hear the concussion of the guns more clearly and the flash of bursting shells was brighter. Then the ship disappeared for the second time over the ocean. We return you now to CBS in New York. 
The Battle of Los Angeles did in fact claim six lives. Three civilians were killed directly by friendly fire, while three others suffered heart attacks during the event. A number of buildings were also damaged by a barrage of more than 1,400 shells from anti-aircraft guns, with no visible effect on the craft itself. It eventually drifted leisurely south towards Long Beach and vanished from view. Some people have suggested that the Japanese were launching planes from a secret base in Mexico, while others theorized that they had developed a submarine capable of carrying aircraft. Of course, the Germans were also rumored to have U-boats large enough to launch aircraft from, but for some reason, many technological aspects of World War II is still, still kept classified as is Operation High Jump, where the Allied Armed Forces invaded Antarctica in 1946 with a massive armada consisting of thousands of soldiers and three aircraft carriers, yet the public is still kept in the dark despite over 70 years having passed since the United States, Britain, and the other Allies suffered their mysterious defeat in 1947. It's almost as if there's still some sort of threat that remains out there. Otherwise, why the secrecy? And to whom exactly would this threat be directed at? He was assigned to active duty in a 20 and back program. Then Jason began specialized training in 1994 to serve as an officer in the ground forces of the Interplanetary Defense and Reaction Forces, known as IDARF secret space program while he was a student at Florida Tech. I would like to welcome for the first time to Fade to Black, Jason Rice. Jason, welcome. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me tonight, Jimmy. When you're talking about the history of Mars or the history of the moon, these are things that aren't, it's the opposite. It's not conventionally found on the internet. Is this That's information correct. taught to you in the program or are you picking this up as you know, from scuttlebutt from other uh, soldiers? Uh, this is information that is not taught to us ground pounders in the program that I was in. Uh, again, you got to remember, the, the secret space program and the cabal have uh, assured their privacy, their secrecy by compartmentalization. So the, you know, the Manhattan Project had over 100,000 people working on it, but they didn't know that. And so through compartmentalization, they were able to keep the full picture away from so many people. The announcement uh, by Donald Trump, our president of the Space Force, uh, was announced. And I think all of us raised an eyebrow as to the timing of it and to what is uh, what is actually being represented by creating this and a new... Uh, wing of our armed forces and, you know, a new division of the, the Pentagon. That being said, sure. was this, uh, is this part of the secret space program? Trump hasn't been in office that long for them to have built and gone through the entire process, even in a black project, to build a satellite. It's, there just wasn't enough time. So I think that Trump's mentioning or coming out with, you know, hey, we're going to have the new Space Force, was um, a part of the unmasking, uh, the drip-drip disclosure, um, to get to the point where he can say, hey, look, we've got these assets in space. Hey, look, we've got this technology in space. I have some other suspicions that we can get into. In fact, we could talk about that at you know another night or this evening about a number of things, and it has to do with the Mars Germans. We're going to get to the Mars Germans, and I had to uh, go back and listen a few times to make sure that that was exactly what you were saying. All right? I was like, did he say Mars Germans? Uh, we're, <laughs> uh, yeah, we're going to spend some time on that. Can you describe uh, to me and the audience your uniform identification and patches? 
I can absolutely do that. We had a number of uniforms. The, the field uniforms were form-fitting. Uh, they had, um, I forget the name of them, but straight-up collars. Um, we also had uh, a you know, camouflage pattern. It was like a digicam, sort of. Um, we didn't rely on the uniforms for camouflage per se because we had uh, technology that allowed us to disappear, so we thought, to phase in and out uh, of a view. So the, the pattern or the camouflage of the uniforms was more for garrison purposes than anything else. The real technology in the uniforms came through from the, the layering of the material. The anti-ballistic um, properties of the material, uh, as well as the heat and cooling dissipation of the material, um, they were also uh, electrical generations. Um, that's one of the uniforms. That's the, the field uniform. The, the patches on it uh, were those of us from Earth had a plain E on one shoulder, and on the other shoulder we had the unit designation that uh, we were in, which was the Panzer Division. And, and that one was a, a, what I first thought was a really strange looking rampant dragon. And it turns out it was a rampant bear. Specifically, the Berlin bear. You also mentioned that all of your commanding officers were German. Okay, yeah. now we need some explanation here and clarification. Why is this the case? The parent organization for the unit that I was in was Mars German, originated and commanded. And the reason for that is they held the cards when the deal was struck, and we have we can get into that at some point. I think that's at least another hour conversation. Mm -hmm. when, the, when the deal was pinned, that was part of the arrangement, was that, you know, look, we, we need people, and you're going to get X, but we're going to be in charge. We're going to determine where they go and what they do, and none of Earth's forces that are going to be involved in this program are going to make above the rank of major because they're not going to be in command positions because those are all going to be Mars Germans. Okay, let's clarify. So allowed to... Well, let's let's clarify really quick because we're going to discuss this a lot. What is a Mars German? Okay, a Mars German is the breakaway civilization that started off in Antarctica. Once they moved everything out of Antarctica, they had still had their facilities there and enough manufacturing capability that they could do things there if they wanted to. But you got to remember, they'd already started their civilization cities on Mars. And so New Berlin and New Würzburg were the results of those. And they had a significant population by 1990 in which that was their home. That's where they were. That's where they were based out of. They were no longer based out of Antarctica. They were on Mars. They were on Mars. They could do anything and everything they wanted to there. Didn't have to worry about any other pesky governments sneaking in or coming in and doing this or that and wiping out their civilization. It was a continuity of their species in their minds, considering that they're the same species as we are. But that that's that was their that's their mentality. Okay, but a place where we feel like we can be safe. The result was uh, two Mars German cities where they have a breakaway civilization. And the Germans uh, discovered certain technology down in Antarctica, if I'm understanding all of this correctly, which allowed them to... Uh, in the late 30s, uh, during World War II and, and, the, and the 40s, to go to the moon and go to Mars. Were the Draco already occupying the moon and Mars at this time? 
Well, just to clarify a little bit, the, the, the Draco did not give the Germans technology. No, they discovered they it. Them. Right, right. They made a deal. We made a deal, and the technology that was found down there, the Germans had to hand that over. So they didn't get any piece of that. None of that action went to Germany for 25 years. That was part of the deal. And so after that deal, they were able to actually get some of the stuff and start figuring it out because you know, they had not been able to get their hands or their, their engineers and scientists had not been able to get their hands on it because they've had to turn it all over. How were so the what, technologies that. Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead, Jason. Go ahead. I was just going to say that the technology that they developed to build their base on the moon as well as on Mars bases, um, they had organically developed. And that had started off with the secret societies of the 30s, uh, those prototypes that were already in operation when the Germans took them. So, so they'd already started mm-hmm. with a car and then, okay, well, let's let's make a Ferrari now. And so the technology was in place and the logistics and the infrastructure was in place for the secret space program. The Germans had the jump on it uh, in front of all of the rest of us. Therefore, those are the commanding officers in this program today. The infrastructure is there because they built it first. The Well, one of the things we haven't covered is the... the the agreement behind how IDARF was started and the commanding officers being German. Let's go. Well, all right, let's do it. When in 1990 timeframe, uh, the, the Germans were tired of and did not want to be involved with the Draco any more than they absolutely had to. And if you recall, the piece of property that they had traded for uh, was part of the Draco territory. And so they decided they wanted to go somewhere else. Unfortunately, they still had time left on the clock for their lease. And that contract was specific. They couldn't change that. And so they had to find somebody else that would take over the lease. Well, any guesses who it was that they found to take it over? The Cabal, who happened to be looking for a moon base in the early 90s, and who was more than happy to pen a deal with him. Well, the deal turned out that the Cabal had to provide a 25, about 25,000 soldiers for use where and when that the Mars Germans needed. And those soldiers ended up being the IDARF ground soldiers, and they put the Germans put, uh, the Mars Germans put protections in place so that they would always maintain control of it, which is how and why they limited uh, command positions to just the Mars German born. And it also meant that they were able to field a large number of, of combat forces without having to dedicate or devote that large of a number of their own troops. So when the Germans arrived on the moon, well, actually, let's get ahead. Who occupies the moon today? Who is in control of the uh, moon today? The The Mars Germans still have a base there. It's just not where it used to be. The Cabal's secret space program now occupies the grounds where the old Mars German moon base was. Now, isn't the you, swastika, swastika shape that's now been filled in, so it looks like a bunch of rows of buildings. And you have described the moon as actually uh, that that's that's artificial. That's correct. Okay, so what is on the inside of the moon? In that we describe bases on the outside. That's what you're describing now. The swastika shaped base, but that's on the outside. But the entire moon is artificial. It's a ship, right? It is artificially augmented. Uh, There are parts of it that are machine. There are parts of it that are rock and stone. And you've got about two miles of the best radiation protection on the surface. 
Okay, so uh, it's it's half uh, natural. It, it, oh, I, I got it. It's an augmented natural uh, facility. Um, let's. Yeah. Uh, we, we need to take a break right here. We're at the top of the hour, so let's do that. And when we get back, we've got to uh, we got to talk about Mars. And well, they're called Mars Germans, right? So uh, let's let's talk about Mars, and we're going to continue this conversation. Fascinating stuff, Jason. You stay right there. Uh, the Germans uh, doing interplanetary travel. Uh, uh, much uh, way before 1969 and, and Apollo 11 and, and us going to the moon. How how did they get to the moon? How did they get to Mars? Uh, they had their own anti-gravity technology you know, going back to the late 30s, in which uh, by the time that they were Oh, building out their base on the moon and starting their base on Mars, uh, they'd already made some advancements on that original technology. So, you know, they made, uh, it's like taking uh, a colonial, uh, a colonial town and handing over an con- internal combustion engine to them. Uh, the Royal Society as well as the other secret societies already had working models, working prototypes of these anti-gravity saucers. So the, the Germans had a, a huge leg up in that they were able to start. You know, one of the, one of the things I found extremely fascinating is that, you know, the, the Antarctic Germans at the time um, had that technology when Admiral Byrd went down and when the, his operation was turned around and returned back to the United States, it was what four or five months later. That's it. That we had the crash in Roswell. It wasn't very long after Admiral Byrd returned, and so my my thoughts on it are that there were those that felt uh, the playing field needed to be leveled, and so that that Roswell was a deliberate crash to uh, deliver a care package. Uh, we, we're talking about the Germans uh, a lot here. Uh, Germany today, are they involved? And and what about what about Russia and China and and Great Britain or Spain or France or Brazil? Are there any other countries involved with us uh, besides us and and Germany? My suspicion is that each of the major industrial powers have their own secret space program of varying technical advancement. The um, European, Union, European Union and the West have by far the most advanced. Uh, that's where the industrial might is. That's where the, the focus has been. Um, so you have a range of competing secret space programs that are involved in their own, going about their own business. Uh, The cabal has uh, a stranglehold over every country that has a central bank. They had different branches, if you will, similar to Western armies, uh, like artillery, uh, armor, um, engineers, infantry, and then medicine. Most of those branches, other than infantry, were filled out by the Mars Germans. While the idea of anti-gravity spaceflight, or a breakaway German colony on the moon, or even a subterranean base in Antarctica, might sound like science fiction or made-up stories, what can be said for certain is it is not a new idea and one that does not seem to be easily explained away. Why don't you pull it off the hook? Uh, the film on that's called Occult National Socialism or Magic National Shamanism is a panel discussion with Chan Johnson and Al Bilek on the extraterrestrial and celestial roots of uh, Nazism. Uh, 
I mean, the real roots for everything that happened in Germany <coughs> and all the atrocities perpetrated by the SS and the Nazis lie much, much deeper, actually much, much higher beyond, uh, beyond our planet, uh, beyond the shallow causes given to us by the political, economic, financial explanations for the origin of the Second World War. Uh, through banking and political conspiracies and so on. Uh, the secret societies in Germany, uh, the Thule, the Brill, the Hugin, and many others, were at the forefront of the ideological, um, how should we say, indoctrination and preparation of the Nazi party and the elite of the SS. And it's a lot more important to know what these societies were standing for than to know what was decided on this or that Nazi Party Congress at Nuremberg. On top of the, uh, I mean, these secret societies were the main ideologues of the Nazi philosophies. However, these societies were only the agents or the fifth columns, the manipulators, on the level of our planet for the interests of half a dozen alien races, the Pleiadians, the, uh, the Orions, the Greys, that have been stationed permanently here on Earth and that have been fighting with other alien races for supremacy on the planet. According to our belief, uh, half a dozen alien races were involved in the, with the Germans and the Nazis. Pleiad Pleiadians joined in to help because they were worried that their uh, Aryan seed on the planet would get wiped if the Germans get too much beaten during the war. So that's why they join in with their technology. Then we produced a very interesting new film, The Hollow Earth or a Nazi, in brackets Illuminazi to be exact, uh, underground the South Polar city of two million people called the New Berlin. Free energy source of dreadnoughts in low level demo flights over testing grounds in Germany, 1942-45. Uh, ID numbers, insignia, and the pilot's head are clearly visible through the perspex cupola. Panzer turrets and naval artillery turrets were suspended upside down on the underbelly of these craft. Some of them were dreadnought size, and we would see them soon in the are presentation. These drawings are actual photographs. Photographs. These are all photographs. Uh, also, in that film, they talk about German World War II space flights with the exoatmospheric craft, half a dozen craft to the moon, Mars, and beyond. Uh, most important is the German secret presence in the colony, the German colony in the South Pole, on the South Pole. Admiral Byrd's expedition in 46-47 to fight the Germans, their unsuccessful expedition, he was beaten back in about two weeks, lost most of his planes and retreated in disgrace. Uh, and subsequent recent rumors that we've heard about uh, an underground city that is two million people strong. The tall, blonde, blue-eyed, Nordic-type guys that a lot of contactees have seen behind the scenes in a little gray abduction scenario may be nothing more than the new supermensch German from the South Pole doing a much broader scale experiments on the whole of the American population. They did these experiments in private labs, late last and early this century, in private Illuminati <coughs> labs. Very interesting film on the German South Polar presence and on their advanced anti-gravity craft. Then, of course, we have several other films here. One is the terrestrial component of the alien presence, or one century of secret Illuminati projects well to the public as the new and ultimate threat, the alien threat. Uh, for one century uh, or more, the Illuminati super black R&D projects in anti-gravity, space flights, m mind control, and human genetic engineering have been very conveniently covered up behind real alien visitations. And the little greys are a good candidate for the cyborgian or biological robot Igors of the underground gulago of government Frankensteinian factories where genetic uh, research on humans goes full blast, including hybrids with animals. What the Germans did 50 years ago in the concentration camps is done on a much greater scale in the underground uh, cities here. 
We have another film uh, that is uh, it's upcoming, Free Energy, The Illuminati Anathema. Uh, and in that film we would compare German free energy dreadnoughts of World War II that reached the moon and Mars without using a drop of fuel uh, with the Illuminati manufactured Element 115 saucer of Bob Lazar, the gas guzzling saucer of Bob Lazar that uses an incredibly expensive fuel. The Illuminati and the bankers make sure that in the next and the other centuries to come, of all the other available free energy source of drives in the universe, they would choose the very few ones that have expensive fuel. And what a more expensive fuel than an element 115 fuel that is not even found on this planet and has to be brought from far away. Uh, in this way they assure you that if you want to drive a saucer, basically you have to give them all your pay for a lifetime in order to be given the privilege to have a private element 115 driven saucer at a time when the Germans went to the moon on free energy 50 years ago and Tesla had a free energy car 80 years ago that ran for three years without any problem John Keeley created a free energy 250 horsepower locomotive in the 1860s 1870s that was pulling trains and many other free energy devices my name is Robert Sepper Thank you for keeping an open mind. Please don't forget to subscribe. And I greatly appreciate everyone who shares these videos. See you next time.